want to thank the Lord for what God is doing. I'm so excited to see what God is doing and to hear the things I'm hearing. I missed the meeting at Abba because I was sick, was down. I didn't know what was my problem. I was treating malaria and I treat malaria like every two weeks and it was not going. I didn't know that one nice shoe I like, it's a slip-on shoe, I bought in Germany, suede, and I like it and people praise it everywhere I go, it, but it was tight on my toes, but I wear them because I liked it, and it helped me to come out you know, from the shoe at security points as I traveled around the world, you know, and my toes were complaining and I didn't pay attention until the toes began to get sour and uh, I was forced to remove the shoe and begin to wear sandals. And then uh, from the toes, I had an infection and um, the infection took place when I was praying in a meeting of his friend in Enugu and somebody was falling under the anointing and kicked the nail of one of the toes up and blood was everywhere. And so they, and I had just finished. I was just rounding up and laying hands. So they rushed me to my guest room, got doctors, tied it and all that. I went to Potakot, they put injection, tore it out, you know, um, in orthopedic hospital. And before it got healed, then I didn't know there was an infection. So that infection stayed there and was causing me fever and other things. And I was treating malaria. And first month, second month, third month, it began to affect other things in my body. I was treating malaria. You know, for some reason, we are told in Nigeria, if you are sick, first of all, treat malaria. <laughs> That's the old mindset we are talking about. And I almost died. And so, until uh, a team of um, consultants began to say, I, and they were running tests on me. All my vital organs were perfect. So, uh, they couldn't put their finger on what the problem was. So, I told them either that something is wrong with your test you know, tools or something is wrong with all of you. I, I, I'm sick and your doctors, tell me what I'm suffering from. And they couldn't. So, they now said, okay, they will not use the test results. They will not treat me as they see me. So, they began to, you know, use everything that they could get. Uh, first, they said there must be an infection. They went for five days, uh, giving me injection morning and evening, morning and evening. The fever didn't stop. They went for seven days. The fever didn't stop. They went for 10 days. And then the fever stopped. So they said, okay, now that one is ruled out. They began to run some other tests. So some of my sons got mad. They said, I must leave the country. I have a doctor who is, uh, my daughter is a doctor in the U.S., said, Daddy, if you die, you kill yourself. Come over to the U.S. I said, I'm not coming. The reason was that I was flying in from, um, uh, I was flying in from one of these countries in the Caribbean islands, back to Nigeria. I stopped in Miami to connect Lufthansa to come to uh, uh, Nigeria. And then I, I was told that I cannot continue the next day. I said, why? They said, all flights have been canceled. I said, why? They said, there's something called COVID. I said, and so what? So I thought it was going to be like three days or maybe overnight, one, one week, two weeks. And I was a refugee in the US for five months. I had to fight to get a seat in a chartered flight to bring myself back to Nigeria. And I told myself, abroad, good night. <laughs> Anything abroad to count me out. Their own chapter is closed. So recently, my sons just got money and said they had to fly me out you know, to run a proper check on me. So they forced me and then took me to UK. And uh, I came back from UK a few days ago, you know, from a medical check. And some of them 
will be shocked. This is my first outing since I came out. And, uh, but um, I'm a beneficiary of raising people who can rescue you. Uh, they came to my rescue. Yes, they, they did. And uh, I'm able to stand here, speak to you, because they did. Otherwise, I didn't have strength and I didn't know what I was suffering from. I didn't have headache. I had stopped having fever. And the, the, the test couldn't show what I was suffering from. And I was dying. And I couldn't do anything. I couldn't pick up phone calls. I didn't have the strength to handle the phone. And I said to myself, God, if you want to take me home, is it like this? Eh? The crowd, the sick of, they said, I have swum the mighty ocean. I have swum seas and rivers. Is it in the small creek they will pick me like I don't have strength? Uh, what is this? Um, I was afraid for my life. And as I was listening to him, I was blessed, mightily blessed. Because I'm a life coach of presidents, prime ministers, leaders, fathers. You know, and uh, he was speaking to me because I have been in the Old Testament and I have young people before me and, um, and I'm, I'm listening and I'm learning too from them. Praise the name of the Lord. So I'm so excited for him because I had always wanted to be there for him. Yes, I love his spirit. I love his spirit and he brought everything that God had, you know, given him and experiences and exposures in the biking industry back home to the church so that he can help us. One of the challenges we have is that those of us in the church um, need training, need regular upgrade, but we don't realize it and so we don't go for it. I expected that the people who are now fathers of the church in Oware should have been here. You know, I knew them when they were boys, and I was looking forward to seeing them here. You know, some of them have retired as bishops, but if you retire, doesn't mean you would die. You, know, you, you can die while you are still alive, and and they'll be referring to you in the past. There was a time when that man was, and you are still alive. You know, I was expecting them to come. But there's this tendency that if you've been there and around for a while, you don't need anybody to teach you anything. You don't need to learn anything. And that's part of our trouble today. And um, please, don't fall, don't fall into that mood. Yes. As long as you're alive, you, know, you can rebound. You can, you, know, you can transform yourself. And then you can be useful to every generation. You, you won't expire while you are still breathing. You know, it's not very necessary. Um, they asked me to bring some books along. I, I didn't know whether there would be time for people to buy any books, but I've written over 30 books, both in English, in French, in German, in Spanish. And, uh, and one of them is something that I will be sharing with today, and I don't even see the book here. You know, <laughs> they just put to what they like. Okay, battles at the gates. Okay, it's here. Battles at the gates. Then there is one on altars. This book on altars, I was forced to write it by our team in the US, in Florida. They said, if you don't bring a book on it, don't come. I don't like the humming of the, of the microphone. Then there's apostolic leadership. And there is brokenness, an inevitable experience for spiritual significance. One pastor I love, Pastor Omako Sarah in Abuja, read this book and bought 3,000 copies. 
It so blessed her. Have you read the book before and buy, buy 3,000 copies? Yeah, she read the book and uh, bought 3,000 copies. And then this one is four levels of spiritual warfare. These are old time books that have been used to raise generations. Except the battles at the gates, which is something that I wrote uh, after I wrote Elders at the Gate. So, if you have time to look at books at the end, but I won't be here because I'll be rushing back. We have a major conference that starts um, next tomorrow. The conference of youths, the conference of women at Gilgal in Obuzasa. So they are waiting for me tomorrow is Saturday. There will be no banking facilities available. Maybe we will leave the book with someone else to handle for us. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm asked to, the theme is the future. And I am asked to speak on securing the future. And in bracket, drawing from the wells of the fathers. Of the fathers. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. And I pray that the few words I will share will be a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Talking about the future. We're talking about tomorrow. During the time I was sick, people were gathering and praying for me. And one night they were having a night vigil. I have a chapel in my house. And um, somebody raised a song. And that song in Igbo was sung like that. E Iriobam Bia Omata Mariji Bia. And when I heard that song, something, something that normally happens to me when I am stared up in the spirit happened, and a man who can't get up from the bed, I jumped from my bed. Omata Mariji Bia. It's only God that knows the future. He knows today. He knows tomorrow. And I want to say that um, I'll use Abraham for a character study because there's so much to say. That man looks like an elderly man. Bring him. Uh, Usher. Usher, bring that man and his wife. Bring them. Bring them to this chair here. Uncle, come, come, come. Uh, come. Come this way. Yes. If I'm seeing well. Please put your hands together. Bring him. Bring him. Come. Keep coming. Keep coming. Come, come on, sit down. Oh, Udama Junuka, I know this meeting. No, 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 no. So I want to use Abraham for a case study. And we will see how fast we can go. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying do not be afraid abram i'm your shield you are exceedingly great reward but abraham said lord god 
what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus and Abraham said look you have given me no offspring indeed one born in my house is my heir and behold the word of the Lord came to him saying this one shall not be your heir but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of all of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old Haifa, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Also, the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a great, at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, that shall, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark. But behold, there appeared a smoking oven, a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the, Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gagashites, and the Jebusites. drawing from the wells of the fathers. Abraham was a figure that had a good heart and clean hands. He had a pure heart and clean hands. He chose to live uprightly and he was attractive to God. So God decided to use him to lay a foundation for what he would do on earth. And we call him the father of faith, our spiritual father. He had, number one, he had a true and dynamic relationship with the Elohim God. So God could talk to him and he would hear him and talk back to God and God will answer so they had that kind of relationship number two you could see that the Bible said on verse 18 on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham they had a covenant relationship covenant is something stronger than business partnership Partners can get into business and then somehow along the line 
They don't want to get along anymore. They dissolve the business and they go their personal, private ways. A covenant is something much stronger. God seeks those who will worship him in a covenant relationship. This man had a covenant relationship with God. So God could be called the God of the man, the God of Abraham, because he had a covenant relationship with him. And this is a positive foundation for many generations, for many, 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 many generations. And um, if you look here, you will see God talking to him that somebody born by you, not yet born, will be born. And he's talking about four generations or 400 years, not yet born. And God was talking with him and he was laying foundation for a future. Some of you, when we're talking about future, you're talking about business proposals of, of something you, are, you want to execute in the next one month, in the next few months, maybe in the next year. Some of you even want it when you live here now, you, you know, launch into it. But uh, this man had the privilege to have insight into what will happen 400 years and how it will happen and what will happen how you know as the things happen so he was a very strong uh, foundation and look at how the bible describes him in james chapter 2 verse 23 uh, it says abraham believed god is quoting exactly what was written here and it was accounted for him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God okay this is James writing he said Abraham was called the friend of God uh, looks, look, let's look at Isaiah Isaiah 41 verse 8 so but you Israel my servant this is God speaking through a prophet Jacob whom I have chosen the descendants of Abraham my friend right okay God was his friend right look at second Chronicles 20 7 to 8 are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel now this were the kings now asking God in prayer and gave it to the descendants of Abraham your friend forever so generations after generations beyond Jacob now this is beyond David their sons and their great grandsons are in prayer talking to God they said our great grandfather was he not your friend okay In this town, where the Igbo now, Ezukata, the Igbos gathered to do what they call Ahiajoku lectures. Sometimes it's done annually. I haven't heard about it since last year. I wasn't in Nigeria most of the time. But what is Ahiajoku? One day I called the, the, the chairman, Khan chairman for Imo states. Past culture, not the current ones. And I said to him, What is this Ahajoko lectures? If the Ahajoko is the Ahajoko that I know, then we still have a problem. In the course of what I was doing, because I was moving everywhere in the world, tearing down demonic structures. After I have burnt down over a thousand shrines in Abia State, the Lord said, you won't go beyond where you are now, except if you go to your own kindred and destroy the one there. I went to our royal father, the king, and I told him, he said, you have to go and negotiate this with your people because it's a common shrine. It's a communal shrine. So 
and went to the oldest man who keeps the Ofon Ogu and the Hanjoku of the, of the kindred. And I begged him, sir, no, this thing has not helped us. There's no single story building in my kindred. And um, I happen to be the first graduate in my kindred, and that is not good. Uh, the ones that are abroad in the U.S., everywhere, are suffering. Uh, there's nobody here who is making progress. Sir, uh, God said we should bring the uh, Hanjoku. The, it doesn't get to the ground. It, it's kept up. They, they say if it gets down, there'll be trouble. Can you bring it out? Let's destroy it. He asked me, so is that what they taught you in your university? I said, no, sir. I'm talking about God. He said, well, everybody has his own God. That Ahanjok is also our God. You know, so you can because of your own God and come and destroy our own. As I was leaving, my heart began to boil. So this man will hold my future. This man will truncate my destiny. I went back to uncle, can you give me that thing so we can destroy it? Can I, can I give you money? You call a meeting of the kindred. Let me address them. He said to me, if you want to go somewhere, go. I will not do that. I said, sir, then you will go blind. After two weeks, you will die. And when they call me to bury you, I will not come. So come here. Are you talking to me? I said, you know me as your son. But you also need to know me as a prophet of God. I left him. Whatever he said, I don't know. A few days after I left, I was told he had become blind. Two weeks after that, I was told he has died. Then somebody else was asked to carry the Ophologo and Ohanjoko. Who carried it? By, because it is given to the oldest person in the kindred. The man became blind. He said they should go and bring me before he dies. That he knows that once somebody, the other person went blind, the next thing was death. And he didn't want to die. My kindred sent a delegation to Potakot to go and bring me. <laughs> I told them I'm not coming. I told them that the only way I can come is if the invitation is to destroy the thing. They said, yes, we'll give it to you. Whatever you want to do, you do with it. I took some of my people and I drove down to my kindred. And then we brought that thing out. And do you know what is inside it? The skull of Umaji, the skull of Unjoku. That's why it's called Anjoku. So, if there was a man whose name was called Anjoku, when he dies, they will, they will take him to a shrine somewhere. When he decomposes, they collect the skull. And then, when he was alive, if he was to marry a woman, he will marry a woman called Maji. If he does not marry Maji, he will have trouble. His children will die while he's still alive. And he will die a miserable death. And I've seen this thing walk somewhere. There's somebody we call Denjoko in my village. His children who grew up with me are all dead. He's blind now. And in his own case, he married a woman who was not a Maji before, mistakenly, and then looked for Maji and married Maji. Maji means the, god, the goddess of Kokoyam. The, the, the ancients don't name their daughters goddess of Kokoyama anymore. But I still hear people call them Joko. Where the people here, they call them Ajoko. I, I have a friend who answers that name. And I've been, trying to, I've been talking to him. I've been to his village. I've been trying to deal with some things. And they will shift because he wouldn't, he wouldn't change the name. So I went and burnt the thing. And do you know, we got electricity, our road was graded, 
story buildings began to come up and the story of my community changed for me in the work of the ministry I, I felt lighter and I could go beyond the past but in this town the elders the fathers are still worshipping old gods not Elohim the foundation they have laid is speaking negative things about the future till tomorrow it is difficult to crush Israel they are six million in total they are less than Imo state in population the seventh million are strangers they have their record those who came from us who are living with them so there are seven million in total but you can't crush them otherwise Iran could have done that the secret of the inventions in Germany is tied in Israel the wealth of America is in the hand of the Jews the future now our fathers who worshipped Abara Njoko Anyamu Inhuala so what future have they given to their, their children he came to see me last night and they mentioned one man's name and I said to him the father and the mother are from Imo State and they were native doctors in this town I met him and uh, many stories he left home to go to a higher institution and the demons came after him he said to me they carry me from my head my, my bed and they hit my bum bum on the ground and he wanted to go mad he wanted to leave the institution plus the fact that he had sicknesses the juju of the father the juju of the mother the shrines they have in the village couldn't Those are the foundations that they have laid for us. Well, we led him to Christ. He tried, he tried to lead his parents to Christ. Things changed, you know, a great deal. That's why the Igbo man, when he's doing politics, he will bring coughing and ask whoever he's helping to swear. That's why the governors, before they give you an appointment, they carry you to Okeja Shrine. That's what they inherited from their mothers and their fathers. And it has not helped the Igbo race. I work in 73 countries. And when I get into nations, I go to American embassy. And I want to know how many Igbos are there. I'm a spiritual father to about 3,000 leaders around the world. And how many Igbos are prospering? outside or where I just came in from UK I met one Igbo man in a retreat of about a thousand people and in that place there were about 700 of Yoruba pastors and I met one Igbo man Even in the banking industry, tell him he was like a director of a bank for the whole of West Africa, not Nigeria. Tell him how many Igbos were there at the top, our bank managers. I have many of them who are my spiritual sons and daughters, who are bank managers, who are regional managers, as I'm talking about now. If I want to do anything about banking I, I'm, I'm good to talk to a Yoruba person not to an Igbo person 
For those who are watching outside who are not Igbos, please don't be offended. The time we come to your, any time we come to your own zone, we will concentrate there. So the foundations they laid made us very individualistic. I, I don't even know why he came here and he's investing his own money. You know, it's just a different man. Maybe because he has lived in Lagos. Come and live here. You will do what you're doing. Ask the bishops here. Ask the pastors here. You know that you fight yourselves. Is it not true? One person cannot bring us something good and others will come and support it. The others will kick it so that it will spoil. You told me that the PFN here has a problem. I, 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 and yet the PFN work in the east, the whole of south, south, southeast started here in nowhere at Concord Hotel. That's where the man, the first man who talked about PFN came to Ure. And that's the Ure where it will have problem. Because it's evil land. So the foundations of Abu, the question of Abara, of idolatry, has not helped us. I was inside an aircraft in Nairobi. I saw an Onisha boy coming. You know, they make noise everywhere they go. <laughs> Carry his uh, handbag, throw in the business class up, and was walking to the back. He said, Nabi Abiko. Now, a security check, who owns each bag. And if you're not around to say it's your bag, they will take it out. Do you know what the person said? Obasrage. It was this side. So, what did our fathers do that we, we lost it? Or what have, have they continued to do? You see somebody coming out for election, he will go to a graveyard. He's calling the dead to help the living. Mm -hmm. So, let's begin to dig good wells. Genesis 26. Verse 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found wells of running water there. The next verse said there were oppositions, but look at verse 22. And he moved from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. This city is called Heartland. It's called the heart of the Igbo land. If we are to redig the wells of our fathers, of what we know, I don't want to talk about them. Because they are past now. They are. They are. What did you call the gods? Is it old gods? Or the gods were not supposed to use. It was said here now. What did, you call, what did he call them? Come on. Right here, I heard them talk about depending on what gods. Eh? Wrong or old gods, eh? Wrong. You see, there were stories about our cities and our lands. And we bragged and prided ourselves in evil. 
na libo agi chige chichi iga abia ku ihe ojo ni imela eji ase na na atante ata na anage jige bwebu when the drums start beating and you come out they beat the drum they beat the drum you come out give you ko mado le ni igbola an ine ku ana akro ata what a wrong value system. I won't go. I never had them come out to say, I asked There was a need in the community, and I solved the need. And I built this, I did this. No. I bet you go about that. He would dance to the tune of the thing. And then, atrocities he has committed. If that, those are the wells they dug, we can't redeem those wells. We should close them. But if we found men, we need to pray that out of us, God will raise men like Abraham, who will have covenants with him, who will take care of each other. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 14, that he heard that the son of his brother Lot was carried away. He took his own men he raised. He went after the enemies, fought them and recovered his brother in nowhere else. If they hear that now one church is attacked, the other pastors will go and buy non-alcoholic wine and celebrate. Uh, you know, you go on the make Those foundations have, have not helped us. As we are talking about these things. We have to dig new wells in our hearts. Dig new wells. Do you know it's difficult to get three boys here, give them 10 million each, and ask them to start business together, and they stay together for two years? Very difficult. I couldn't help Yeah. Yeah. I will ask him to get 10. I will get 10 million. And we will give you. Let's see if you will stay together for two years. On my way from UK, a man came to meet me at my hotel, Radisson Blue in Ikeja. He said he had a problem with First Bank and he needed help. So I sent for the former MD. Of Diamond Bank to come to come and help him. He said, in the midst of his trouble, his uncle has many houses and money. Ndibo, na Lagos. He said that none of the Igbo people he knew, when his businesses was going on and booming, he had a branch here. He had a in the world, He had the branches everywhere. None of them. He said, na here Only two Yoruba men came. One of them gave his house as a guarantee. For a bank to help him. Onyibo. Why should his help come from Yoruba? That's the point I'm making. That, those are the wells we can. I, I'm talking about a few days ago. I have pain. After the, the primate of Methodist Church was kidnapped near his place. You know, around Okigwe. I, I began to call all the topmost church leaders in the East. I said, please, can we meet? Let's begin to discuss what can be done to protect, you know, our leaders so that we, none of them will fall a victim to this kind of thing again. I stand before God and before you. Mona Hakuchi here today. You will agree. Have some on her back tomorrow. Bring her back tomorrow. They won't pick the phone. 
And these are men I have sold into their lives. I help them greatly. Because I'm talking about the well-being, the collective well-being. You know, something, because it's in Ebola, says, it, you know, it cannot be done again. But to an a personal and individualistic thing, I fix your appointment quick, quick. I hang up, walk him back. What kind of wells did our fathers here build for us? From my experience, I have fought the kind of wells I've seen all my life. And I have prayed and cried that our youth will dig fresh wells of unity, of love, of humility. We are very arrogant. You can hear it in our voice. Anytime Igbo people are involved in boarding an aircraft anywhere in the world, the airlines will not follow group A, group B, group C. Because nobody will listen to them. They will not follow the colors on the bottom pass that says color this, color this. The airline staff that stays at the door, at the reception or the door to board, will run away and just announce this flight is going to Nigeria. They're not going to be done. I need push one. Why? Because I'm not. <laughs> And if you are from this country, you'll be very embarrassed. One day it was Ethiopian airlines at Addis Ababa. They normally would give colors. When it was when there was a flight coming to Enugu, when they just started flying to Enugu, upon Enugu flight, I saw the staff carry their things and were running. I said, But won't you board us? He said, You push you board yourself. We are very arrogant. Our voices are so loud and, you know. Everywhere. In the hotel where they put me, very nice hotel. I saw some young boys. I pressed the lift to go to my bed. Some young men walked in. They didn't talk to me. Shana, good morning, please. I said, hey, 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 good morning, sir. As if they were blind before. We have no regard for others. It's worse if the people are working for us. We treat them as if they are no human beings. But I have a son who has a global something outfit and he has staff. He just left this morning to fly back to UK. And I watch him with his own people. We need to dig fresh wells. We need to dig better wells with good attitude, with good value system, with humility. With clean hands and pure hearts, an attitude of caring for each other, loving. And it should start with us who are the redeemed of the Lord. Great grandsons of Abraham will dig those wells and find a way to bring in others who are not saved. Isaac dug again the wells and God gave them a rehoboat. I, I want to mention this as I close. Some of you are fathers. Yesterday I met Elizabeth, the daughter of our convener, and I was pulling her legs. But there was something 
deep down in me that was I was drawing from. I, I want to thank you that you carry your children along. I, her daughter was tell, reminding him they have a hard copy of the program of this event. They have this. That she's involved. I was in Liverpool two weeks ago in a church where a man has the biggest church there in Nigeria and the daughter locked herself up in the father's office and was playing on the phone and if people open the door she look at you and sigh like you are intruding into her privacy so when the father came and said is this your daughter he said yes he said let her come and kneel down here she was like what I said come and kneel down here the father said go and kneel down there so even though the father introduced me as his own father when I said come and kneel down there she was like excuse me so I began to ask her questions is this man your father yes he feeds you pays your school fees yes he bought the phone you are using, yes. Do you care about him? He says, yes, now. I said, well, you see, this church is the pastor. And you don't like the members coming in and going out. You get angry, you sigh. I was watching you. The father says, she's the problem at home. I said, then, do something about it. While I was in the UK, a cousin of mine called me, Uncle, I am about to get married and I want to bring the lady to you. I said, no problem. He said, hey, the major thing, other thing I want to tell you is that I want you to do something big for me. Buy something for me so that I can say this, you bought it for me. I said, eh. I said, I will soon come back and you'll come and see me. And when he comes, I will ask him, when is it that you have come around to total something that you know something fell from hand get to tire foot child and when in your life since you were born my born you have you gone gone an errand on for me so what qualifies you for uncle to buy a big car for you to do this big thing for you selfishness everybody should die so for you Let's watch our attitudes. And I want to thank all the protocol people who have worked so hard to bring me here and do everything to serve. The fastest ladder to greatness is service. But does this attitude of Anyeweng, a man, you know, so let some people in the man run go with it. The only Igbo people who send their children to go and serve others, go to their place. That's where you see the story buildings, the skyscrapers, those who serve. And those who keep their children, say, stay here. Are they feeding us? Go and see their houses falling. So you need you need to be reprogrammed and so you can deliver yourself from some of the wrong foundations of the past then you start thinking differently acting differently so thank you for elizabeth and elizabeth thank you for being elizabeth because sometimes the father can be talking and the girl can be saying, you know, I, I really don't want to be involved, you know. They start speaking in Oyibo English. But I have my own plan. I got more bet, more bet, but. <laughs> <laughs> you 
It's true, we have negligent fathers. They're pursuing business, they're pursuing career, they're pursuing politics. Uh, the children at home with television and social media destroying them on the streets. Later on, they expect them to become saints. But there are fathers that care. Many of you are young fathers. You are the coach of that team. And there's no star without a coach. If your children don't do well, it's the fault of the man. You say it's your wife. Your wife is your technical advisor. <laughs> but it's the coach that designs the game and the pattern. And so you ultimately, the man, is to be held accountable. If, if somebody to be fired when a, the team is not doing well, is the coach. The coach to be fired. You know. So raise a winning team. Raise stars. And uh, you don't raise the team from the distance. There's a time you give yourself to the team. About a few days ago, I called my staff. I said, there was a man in this country who raised an under-17 team that never lost a match. They beat Germany, beat Brazil. They beat Argentina. They beat the big names. They beat everything. And they came back home with the gold cup. I said, please, can you Google the man's name and tell me his techniques? Do you know that they Googled his name and there was nothing Nigeria wrote about the man? I said, this is strange. If it's in the US, his name will be everywhere. To be able to raise a team that wins and loses, wins and loses, and eventually, ultimately win. That's a good thing. But to raise a team that will never lose, to have consistency in their winning pattern from, from A to Z, it's not an easy thing, both for the coach and for the team members. We have lost a lot, and that's what's trying to help us recover. I want to give you four examples. Number one, there is a lady called Theresa May. She was the Prime Minister of UK, of the Conservative Party, before Boris resigned a few days ago. His father was a Reverend Minister, an Anglican pastor. Reverend Hubert. When the girl was about eight years old, she discussed with the father that she would like to be the first prime minister of Israel of the UK. The father said, Why? He said, So I can I can transform UK and make it a godly nation. The father says it's possible. So let's start working on it. But you must listen to me. So the father began to coach him, tell him the cost to read, tell him where to look for a job, whether they pay you too well or not. And she was listening. So when Margaret Thatcher became the first female prime minister of UK, she, the father was still alive, old man. She went back to the father and said, we prayed, we planned. So where did we get it wrong? And the father said, the woman began to walk ahead of you and so her turn came that's what happened your turn is coming so keep walking and her turn came it came at a time that you can needed a swing the christian the world christian body needed that help i'm not going into it now because we don't have the time and she was there as prime minister to move Israel, uh, to move UK out. When you hear Brie exit, it was more than a political move. The church prayed for it to happen. And there was a pastor's girl there to make it happen. 
And I want to ask all the pastors who are here. How many of you are thinking global? How many of you are thinking big? You send your daughters to go and learn home economics so that they'll be cooking very well. They don't, you don't need to pay school fees for them to go and do home economics. Send them to, send them to your grandmother. <laughs> she will teach them how to cook well. Because the battles are fought at the gates, at the places of power, not inside the kitchen. Thank God for JL, who was able to kill somebody with her in her kitchen. But that, that's once in the, in the whole history of the world. So it's possible, Pastor, to raise your daughter to become president of Nigeria at a time that it doesn't look feasible. You can walk her up to it. Number two, Angela Dorothy Mackell, the daughter of a Lutheran pastor, Reverend Husk Kanner, is the middle past chancellor or head of state of Germany. She was about 16 years old, young, when the father began to discuss. Women were not involved in politics. She said, Dad, I would like to be the head of state of Germany. The father looked at her and said, we can start working on it. Join the junior political party of the side of Germany where they were, because Germany was divided. When Germany was united, he said, join the mainstream now. Move as fast as you can. And she joined. And as she was speaking and moving, the father was funding it. And he, she became the chairperson of the opposition leader. It's good to have good fathers. Yes. So, in 20, 2002, she became the leader of the opposition party. And it's called Christian Democratic Union. And what happened? Shortly after that, she became the first female chancellor of Germany. She was elected in 2005. The father was there crying. So it's possible in Germany for a girl to become the head of state. Never happened before. Germans are hard. Germans colonized Cameroon. And when Cameroonians felt the strong hand of Germany, they invoked Satan to come and help drive them out. That's when France came later. They are strong for a woman, a girl, to become their head of state. It took a pastor who knew what to do. 2005, she became the first female chancellor. She ruled for four years. 2009, she contested again and won. Nobody could beat her records. The father was still alive. This time he was smiling and nodding his head. Shortly after that, he died. But the father has dug the well. The father has given her a future. She contested again. After eight years, she won. In 2013, for the third time, she became the head of state of Germany. She ruled till 2018. She contested again for the fourth time and she won. The longest ruling chancellor in the history of Germany and a girl. No man could move her. Recently, she said, I want to step down let somebody come in by herself the highly celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. was son of a Baptist pastor Reverend Michael Luther King he went to visit Germany and was told what Luther Martin Luther did he came back to US and changed his name so his eight-year-old boy said dad now that I answer junior 
Your name is different. My own name is different. Can't I change to Martin Luther Jr.? The father says, if you will do what he did. At eight years old, the boy was resolved with the father. The father dug the well, and the boy began to grow with that foundation. He was thrown into prison 28 times. The father hired lawyers to help him, to get him out. Not because of anything he did. Because he was saying black does not mean evil. And white skin does not mean you're innocent. Let everybody have equal opportunity. They said he has said something beginning at his mouth. At the end of the day, he, become, he became the leader of the American Civil Rights Movement for 13 years. Went to university and graduated when black boys were smoking Igbo. Up until today, you will go and see, ask our convener, black African boys, who are blaming the white men for their problem. Go to the prisons in America, mainly blacks. Why? No, man is the black man who enslaved our parents and, uh, and they didn't give us equal opportunities. When did they abolish the slave trade? Were you born when the slave trade was abolished? How can you be blaming slave trade for being stupid today? But at that time, at the peak of this thing, a man was able to raise a cool-headed boy, focused. He read law and passed and began to lead a movement in a predominantly black people race. And he was heading to be president. And he could have become one until he was assassinated. But he was a pastor's son. When you look at First Samuel 17, as David, he quoted David running to fight Goliath. Saul called Abner and said, whose father? Is that man who dug the well for him? When you see a boy doing well, when you see a girl doing well, there, there is a father somewhere who had dug a good well for that child. Just in case your own fathers didn't dig for you, dig for your children. for your children part of the challenges that we have had as fathers is lack of knowledge like when I came in here I expected the fathers to be here I didn't see them if I was in the country I could have come with him or ahead of him to talk to them you see the things you were saying, as long as they are alive, as much as these ones need what you said, they are the ones that need those ones. Because they are still working with the wrong gods, the old methods, the old styles. And they are blaming the tools. And they are blaming each other and fighting each other. I could have come ahead of him, come and spend some days here, meet them, beg them, make sure they were here. Talking about paradigm shift, it is their own paradigm worldview that needs to shift, that has refused to shift. It has rusted, but it's not shifting. Ignorance. We don't, we don't know any better. Two, there were not adequate preparations for us, for them, at that time. Our Bible colleges were just enough to teach Bible so we can read it and preach. But as for strategies, as for skills, as for methods, as for the dynamics for growth, it was not part of the curriculum. So we didn't know better. 
Three, economic challenges. Some of them didn't have fathers or mothers who had money to pay for them to go to better schools. And that's why you have more educated people in the western part of Nigeria than here. Why? They had free education. Kindergarten, primary, secondary school. Here, our parents paid. Secondary school, here. Before the war, after the war, our parents paid. And if they can't pay, that's it. But in the West, it was free. And it so helped them because if not that we ask, God just blessed us with good IQ. Most of the educated people were there. At that time, it was five naira to fly to London. Yes, five naira to fly to London. And so, some of the young people flew to London. Their parents, their mother self, you know, they, when they become, uh, they have labor, they go there and give birth. If you go there, you have over a million Western Nigerians who are citizens of UK. But you don't have such number from the Igbo side. The dog wells for them. For you, you to even go there to go to school, you pay as an outsider. While they pay five pounds per year, you pay 23 pounds because you are an external international student. The future. So what we did wrong is telling on our children today. So, so telling on us, some of us, economic challenges. They couldn't pay school fees. I had that challenge. My father was a pastor, a rural pastor, a missionary. And when I was in secondary school, my provision in my cupboard was gary and salt and, uh, and sugar. But I told myself I didn't come here to real or not. I told myself I have to pass. And I made grade one. In, um, East Central State employed me to be a teacher. And I knew I wasn't going to stay there. I was going to go forward. And I established a shop in the market to be paying my school fees. I told myself I wasn't going to stay there. My father really wanted me to study and he passed on and i told myself that what i didn't get from relatives i will give to people i'll give to my own children so for about 40 years i have an average of 20 something youths who stay in my house some of them i pay their school. i don't know their mother i don't know their father i pay their school fees they graduate they stay in my house and get married and I send them off as if I'm the parent. That day on the wedding day, you will see the real biological parents. They will show up. One of the girls from Anambra State called me one day. Said, "Dad, I said yes." He said, "Have you always been like this?" I said, "Yes." He said, "When did this start?" He said, "When I was suffering, I made a decision. I wouldn't let anybody around me suffer what I was going through." So, today, any of them that goes anywhere and say they're from Musi Maduba, they say doors open, things happen. I say, because I'd, I've been digging good wells, dig better wells. I, I went to UK for medical treatment. I took money, dollars, just to pay my bills. They said I have to run tests. A young man came to me and said, sir, they said they need a British card. I said, I have one, bank card. He said, no, I'll use mine. The test ran close to a thousand pounds. He paid. I said, no, you shouldn't have used your card because I came with my woman. He said, no, sir, you can't spend any money when we are here. Hey? And the guest house, like a hotel suit where I stayed, 1,000 pounds for five days. He paid. 
So after the test results were out, they began to look for GP. The GP they called that traveled one and a half hours to come and see me, 75 pounds for 30 minutes. When he arrived and saw me, he said, sir, I give, I'd rather give you an offering. You spoke to me when I was young and I'm here today because of you. I started crying. The GP I was supposed to pay 75 pounds for 30 minutes spent two hours with us and gave me an offering and went back to buy the drugs he recommended himself and shipped to me. Dig good wells. It may not be for your children. It may be for you. I came back with all the money I traveled with and I came back with more. Came back with me. Number four, part of what hurt our fathers and they couldn't dig good wells was bad influence of other failed fathers. Because a cousin of mine did not join or conquer with the father, he refused to train her. And I had to step in with my little, close my account to help her. She said, you can now. If she sees me, she's seeing her father, but she doesn't want to see her biological father. I said, no, 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 no. He, he will, she will call him. She's a Christian, pastor's wife, but she's so angry. Till today, she is in her 50s. It's actually late early 60s now and this thing happened when she was under 20. another man another man told the father that any child you have who does not join you in the court is an enemy bad influences so the man didn't train his children who didn't join him today he's old and those children a few of them take care of him. The other said be a good influence. Finally dead spiritual life. They didn't have God as their friend. Rather when you mention God they laugh and they mock at you. still happens today. Some of these boys who stole and rigged the election and became politicians, when you mention God, they laugh, say, nah, can you, uh, we hear that? No. They, they want to change the topic. They, they want to make you think you're a fool. We still have a lot to do. Some of them are your friends, are condemned. They, they, in government house they are the ones that rule now if you mention god i say nah, nah, have a good family. so god is not relevant to those boys one army officer one day was having a birthday because he comes from my area he begged me to come and he came and the preacher was preaching on television while we were waiting for their refreshment, one army officer said, shut that thing down. I was sitting there. He said, um, who is around? Come and shut this thing down. And I said, why? He said, they're all liars. And when you find your cool ways, they're deceivers. He went on talking, 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 talking about preachers. I said to him, it's enough. I am one of them. We are not liars. That's the organ, then go and sit down. Say, shut up! Who asked you to talk to me like that? I am one of them, and that was enough for you to shut up your mouth. If you're a sinner, you are dead in sin, and you are like a dead rat. He said, Are you talking to me as if you think you have strength to walk up to me, shake my hand? You will dry like a stockfish and I will come for your burial. Then others now got up. Oh, nah, you could, because no, no vex. Nah, you could, no, no, no. Nah, nah, you 
I said, but you were here when he was talking the trash and entertaining you with saying things against God and his people. And you people didn't talk. Now, when I got to Abishinani, so that I rebuke that spirit in you. And I command that the blood of God, the Lord Jesus Christ will wash you, your root and your foundation. Ask him, okay, oh, Zola, no, Zola, no, say, okay. <laughs> These boys, because they steal votes and they, they do all they do, they get into, they, they have cars, they have police. So God is irrelevant. What actually can I say? Have good fun. Happy, 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 have that one. They sold their hearts to Satan, had covenants with the grave, the dead spirit of the dead, and India. And they are the ones that are your rulers. How can they dig better wells? When the convener was praying that those of us who have lost grounds will regain our grounds. I was praying that those of us who have no grounds at all should begin to get grounds. Get access to the government house. Contest for the elections. And I don't know whether some of any of you here, there's anybody here who doesn't have PVC. I don't know whether there are, there are some of you who are not connected in any way with politics. The price that people who are not involved in politics pay is to have fools rule them. Get involved. If you can join a political party, get there, run, get involved. I called one young man in a state and I said, do you know of a party like this that is beginning to rise up? He said, no. I said, so what are you waiting for? He said, it's an outside man. He said, no, I don't have money. I said, go and ask about that party now and give me a feedback. He went and found out about the party and there was no gubernatorial candidate in his state. And I, he came and told me, I said, okay, now you go and tell them you want to be the gubernatorial candidate. He started laughing. He went back and asked them. They told him how much. He came and came back and said, it's an impossible. I wired the money to him. I said, go ahead and pay and pick the form. So he picked the form. Today, he is the gubernatorial candidate. Okay, that, that, that's not the issue. He didn't know what to do with himself. I, I told him platforms to set up and things to do um, he called me as I came in from the UK that they had opinion polls in his state about all the governors and gubernatorial candidates but the serving one now and him and he was leading he said to him it's still a mystery it's not a mystery if you have a father if you have a coach and they dig good wells for you. The Bible said, and Isaac began to prosper. And he prospered. And he became very prosperous. That the people in the land became afraid of him. Why? He was redigging the good wells of his father. He called me and said, last night, he called me last night as I was in your hotel. He said that those who are the heads of the ruling parties have come to say, name your price. The way things are going, it looks like the whole country is going to your side. Name your price. We want to pay you and take your position. This was a man they were making mockery of at the beginning. They told him all kinds of things. As of now, they are offering him millions, 50 million. At, 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 at now it's about 150 million. They are asking him, we pay you, you vacate your position, we take it. And he called me. I said, okay, what do you think? He said, so, it didn't start with me, it started with you. That's what I'm telling you. I said, what do you think? He said, when you grow up, your children should start thinking for themselves. 
He said, I told them it's, it's not in my hands. I said, so if it was in your hand, what would you do? Is it a bad thing for a righteous man to answer your excellency? Thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord.